Good morning. It's time to begin our worship service at the Carthage Church of Christ. I want to take this opportunity to welcome everybody here, all our visitors, and especially our members, and especially our visitors. In a moment, I'll be reading from Galatians, the second chapter, verses 1 through 5. Galatians 2, 1 through 5. Again, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody here, especially anybody that might be visiting with us. And we want you to know that we count you as our honored guest and invite you back anytime you're in our area to come and worship with us. Brother Joe Reeves will be passing down the center aisle. If you are visiting, raise your hand, and uh, he's got a visitor's pack he'd like to give you. And, uh, in there you'll find news and notes about the church and a, and a card to fill out so we can have a record of you being here today. And now our Bible reading from Galatians 2, 1 through 5. <clears throat> then 14 years after I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas and took Titus with me also, and I went up by revelation and communicated to them the, that gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but privately to them which were of reputation, lest by any means I should run or had run in vain. But t neither Titus, who was with me, being a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised, and that because of false brethren unawares brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus, that we might bring us into bondage, that they might bring us into bondage, to whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now we'll be led in our song service by Brother Jeremy. All the songs this morning will be on the screen, but if you'd like to use a book, the first song will be number 708. 708. Two hundred and seventy four. Two hundred and seventy four. <laughs>
call before the prayer will be number 499. Number 499, we'll go to God in prayer. bow with me. Kind and merciful Heavenly Father, we humbly approach thy throne of grace at this time, thanking you for all the blessings of life that you've given us. Father, you've blessed us in so many, many ways, physically and materially, but most of all the spiritual blessings that you've given us through thy Son. We give you thanks for all of these. Father, we're mindful of those this morning who are sick and unable to be with us. We pray that your blessings be upon them and their caretakers. We're thankful, Father, that some of our own are able to be back with us. We pray that you'll continue to bless them and strengthen them in the coming uh, days and weeks. Father, we are thankful for the congregation of, of thy people here at Carthage. We pray that you'll continue to bless us and bless the works that we're involved with. We pray that you'll bless the missionaries that we support in foreign fields who often face dangers and trials that we know nothing about. We just pray that you'll bless and comfort them. Father, continue to be with our nation. Bless those who are going to be leading us in the coming years. We pray that you'll give them guidance and wisdom that they may lead this nation in the direction that you would have it to go. Father, as we continue this service this morning, we pray that you'll help us to put away the things of the, our, of the world and focus on you. We pray that you'll bless Brother Anderson as he brings a message to us this morning. Give him a good remembrance of those things that he's prepared. Father, we ask thy forgiveness as we often fall short of thy glory. Help us, Father, to be better. Christians and examples to others in the future than we have been in the past. Continue to go with us and be with us and forgive us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. If you're using your book and would like to mark the song of invitation, it will be number 763. Number 763 will be the song of invitation. Song before the lesson will be number 277. 277. <coughs> I have heard a lot.
I join with what has already been said in welcoming you this morning to our services, and especially if you're visiting, we are doubly honored that you are here. We have several we'll be mentioning later who are back with us today, and we're thankful for their presence and uh, their improvement in health, being able to return and be with us. Our ushers are coming down the aisle even as we speak with study guides. If you'd like one, get their attention and uh, uh, secure one, and then take that and write down the subject of the lesson, or not the subject, but notes on the lesson as we uh, deliver it this morning, and hopefully by writing down the major points and filling in some blanks, you'll be able to uh, study that further as you have time <clears throat> and opportunity to so do. You might be wondering uh, how many friends you have and how smart they are. You can give them a little test if you are into cell phone use and texting and all of that. There was a lady who sent out a text on her phone which said, Lost my phone. Please call the number so I can find my phone. Twelve of her friends called her. You think about that for a minute. She said, I believe I need to change my friends, look for some new friends. If she could send a text, she obviously had her cell phone. But 12 people called her, and they were reading the text message. I thought that was a little comical, but I just wanted to use it to lead into this lesson about the text that God has given us, His Word. He sent us a text message. It's called the Sacred Scriptures. And we need to read and study it daily. And I've chosen a lesson this morning that uh, I feel to be very, very important. I believe that it is of utmost importance that we need a, an understanding of just how wonderful, marvelous, and magnificent the love of God really is. Now, it's not going to be on the screen, so if you have your Bible, turn to Romans 5, and let's read together the first 11 verses of that chapter. The Apostle Paul writing said, Therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom also we have access by faith into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, also knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope makes not a shame. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost who is given unto us. For when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet for adventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies... We were reconciled to God by the death of His Son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom we have now received the atonement. You'll notice that Paul mentions the love of God a couple of times in those 11 verses. He talks about how the love of God has been shed abroad in our hearts 
in verse 5. And then he talks about God commending His love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. I want us to focus on that statement, the love of God. By way of introduction, Romans 5 verse 11 has been described by some as the summary of justification. You'll notice that Paul talks about therefore being justified by faith. Some have made a play on the word justified and said you could say that justification is that God loves us so much that he treats us just as if I'd never sinned. But of course, in this passage, we're reminded of the fact of our true spiritual condition when God, through the sacrifice of his Son, made our justification possible. It was not what we did or what we had earned or what we were worth. But it was because of God's love for us that these things took place. The remainder of uh, chapter 5 is sometimes described as the summary of condemnation. That would be verses 12 through 21. But in Romans 1, going back to the very start of the book, It's interesting to note that in those first 17 verses, you have the revelation of righteousness emphasized. Paul talks about how that through the gospel, which is the power of God unto salvation, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith unto faith, verses 16 and 17. As you continue progressing through the book, you will notice that those first three chapters tell us that there is a need for uh, righteousness. The need for righteousness is seen in the fact that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The all who have sinned in Romans 3.23 includes both the Jews of Romans 2 and the Gentiles of Romans 1. In Romans 1, Paul establishes the sinfulness of the Gentiles. And then in Romans 2, he begins by pointing out, Now, lest my Jewish brethren think, Yes, sir, that's right. The Gentiles are notoriously sinful. You Jewish brethren are in the same position. Paul was a Jew, and he often talked about his brethren who were not Christians, but they were Jewish brethren. And he would point out in the book of Romans that they had gone about to establish their own righteousness and had refused to submit to the righteousness of God. They tried to stay with the law and continue under the law when the law had been taken out of the way and nailed to the cross. And the gospel had been ushered in that new and better way that the Hebrews writer talks about. And so he said, you Jewish brethren are guilty of the same things that the Gentiles did. And so the grand conclusion comes in Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So Paul establishes early on in the book the need for righteousness. How is that righteousness achieved? Through Jesus Christ. What is the power of God to save men from their sinfulness? The gospel of Christ. That gospel must be heard, believed, received, obeyed. As Paul points out in Romans chapter 6, if an individual is going to be righteous. You will notice in Romans 3, beginning in verse 21, through the text that we read a moment ago, 5, 11, 1 through 11, that Paul establishes the fact that there has been a provision made for righteousness. How do men become righteous? 
by embracing that gospel and taking advantage of the sacrifice for the atonement of sins that God provided in the giving of His Son. Now that brings us through Romans 5, 1 through 11. There may be, uh, there are other great texts and tributes on the love of God in the Scriptures. You find that God reminded the children of Israel back in the Old Testament of His love for them. He talked about how He would bless them because of His love for them. His provisions for them as they came out of Egyptian captivity and made their way to the promised land were above and beyond anything that uh, people could ever do or provide. God lovingly delivered them in a very powerful way by the sending of the plagues. He parted the waters of the Red Sea and brought about their deliverance and destroyed their enemies who had rejected Him and been defiant in the face of some of the greatest demonstrations of God's power that's ever been manifested. And yet, God showed over and over again His patience, His long-suffering with His people. And all the time teaching them of the dangers of sin and not doing what He directs them to do. But His love could not be questioned. And you see that all the way through the Old Testament and even throughout the New Testament as well. This, in my opinion, is one of the most striking and stirring of all texts on the love of God. And therefore, I want us to think about it again. Listen to it. But God commends His love toward us. In that, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. In what state were we? We were in sin. And in spite of that, God loved us so much that, as the golden text of the Bible, as it's called, says, He so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son for our sin. John 3, verse 16. I want us to look at three primary points in reference to the love of God. First of all, I want you to think of, with me about the reasons for God's love. Have you ever thought about, why does God love me? Why would God love me? I think all of us have probably wondered about that at one time or the other. In the first place, God loves us because He made us. He created us. You read in Genesis 1, 26 and 27 that man is made in the image of God. And that's not just the male, that's mankind. Male and female created he them. You read numerous passages throughout the Old and New Testaments about the fact that God did indeed create us. But one of the most powerful ones is found in Acts 17. There Paul is in the city of Athens, you will remember, and he's talking to a great audience of very learned and philosophical thinkers, and yet he, without any hesitation at all, says, beginning in verse 25, He's talking of God here. He says, Neither is he worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything, seeing he gives to all life, breath, and all things. God gives to all, number one, life. Secondly, breath. Three, all things. Now, if God can give all of that to man, what does he need? The implication is he already has life. He already has breath. 
He already has all things. So he would be the only one who could impart those things to man. Who gave them to God? No one. It's innate in his ability, his nature, his power. So he's not like the gods that the Athenians were worshiping. And notice, and has made of one blood. God has made us. What is the nature of his creation? They're of one blood. The blood of all races uh, can be shared in blood transfusions if you have the same type of blood. The same type of blood is the same blood in all peoples, regardless of their race. Paul was exactly right and was years ahead of his time medicinally, wasn't he? People didn't know all of this at that time, but Paul said he made them of one blood. And then he said, to dwell on the face of the earth, and has determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation, that they should seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Now listen to verse 28. For in him we live and move and have our being. In whom? In God. In Him do we live, move, and have our being. As certain of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. Paul uses one of the comments that had been made by some poet. We don't really know who wrote it. But that poet, I don't know if he is in the audience or not, But Paul said, one of your own kind has admitted that we humans are the offspring of God. Now, inasmuch, then, as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone graven by art and man's device. Do you follow his logic? What are human beings? We have minds. We're not inanimate objects that can't talk and speak and breathe and move and do lots of other things. He said, now one of your own writers has said that we are the offspring of God. Why then would you think that God is like some of these inanimate objects that you have manufactured? And now you fall down and worship them. Paul establishes conclusively beyond any shadow of a doubt that we are the creation of God. That's why he loves us. Because we're his creation. Have you ever made something and you you enjoyed doing it? You just did it because maybe, uh, in my case, I built a, a baby cradle several years ago when Andrew was on the way. And uh, I really enjoy that baby cradle. I just, I just like to look at it. He was the first grandchild that slept in it. <clears throat> Here a while back, he was up uh, to where it is, and he said, I wonder if I could still get in that. And he did. And it was one side. I think Amanda got a picture of it. Some of you may have seen it on Facebook. But anyway, here and there, I enjoyed that. Why? Because I created it. I built it. And so God loves what he created, all of us. That's reason number one. In the second place, he loves us because it's simply his nature to love. In 1 John chapter 4, in uh, verse 8, and again in verse 16, John makes a very simple but such a profound statement. He said, God is love. There are statements like that throughout the Scriptures that God is. Well, God is love. It's His nature to love. It seems like there are some people today who have a nature of hate. That that can be changed, of course. But God is perfect, and a part of His nature is that He loves. He loves His creation. 
There was a mother once who was asked how she could love her wicked and wayward son. And she simply responded, uh, I love him because I can't help it. He is my son. He is my son. And I can't help it. It's just a mother's nature to love. In fact, someone has said that a mother's love may be the closest thing on this earth to the love of God, separate and apart from God himself. Because mothers just love. That's the way they are. That's the way God is. A third reason that he loves us is because we are now his children. I hope you don't don't miss that in this text. As you read it and you come down toward the end, God commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. But now look at verse 9. Much more than. Now look at that word, or that phrase, much more. And look at how it continues. Being now. Much more than being now justified by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath through Him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more, there you have it again, being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. One translation, instead of much more, says, even more. I love you even more now than I did then. Before I gave my son, I loved you. And because I loved you, I gave my son. And now that you are my sons and daughters, I love you even more. Don't you see how powerful that is and how great the love of God is? He loved us when we were enemies. He loves us even more as His children. Now, let's look at a second point. The reach of God's love. How far can God reach? Have you ever thought about that? In Romans 10, verse 21, Paul quotes an Old Testament passage. He said in Romans 10, 21, no, that's not the right passage. Yes, it is. Romans 10, 21. He quotes from Isaiah chapter 65. And he says, But to Israel, he said, All day long have I stretched forth my hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Back in Isaiah 65, it's not an exact quote, but it's clearly, this is clearly a reference to Isaiah chapter 65, verse 2. Now, backing up to Isaiah 59 for a minute, you'll remember that passage where the writer said, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened. It's not shortened. He can still reach out a long way. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But let's go on over to Isaiah 65 and look for a moment at the exact quotation. Where he said uh, in verse 2, I have spread out my hands all the day unto a a rebellious people who walks in the way that was not good after their own thoughts. This is just sort of a secondary point from that passage. 
But did you notice that when you walk in rebellion against God, you walk in a way that is not good? And the reason you're walking in that rebellious way in a way that is not good is you're following your own thoughts. But for the purpose of this lesson, look at that idea in the first few words. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people. Why? Because he loves you. But notice the reach of God. The reaches of God's love. The reach of His love reaches down to the weak. Go back to Romans 5 now. And notice that He says, When you were without strength, verse 6, that means they were weak. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. Notice the word ungodly. That refers to people who were irreverent. They were impious. They had no respect for the things of God. They neither respected Him or His, nor His way. And so they're described as being ungodly. Notice that the text says, While we were yet sinners, Emphasize the word sinners. The love of God reaches down for those who are neither righteous nor good. They're sinners. He commends His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. And then He identifies us as being enemies. For, in verse 10, For if when you were enemies, all of those words, when you put them together, the word weak or without strength, ungodly, that is irreverent and impious, sinners, those who miss the mark, those who have refused to do what's right, and enemies, all of those put together denote total alienation and separation from God. And remember Isaiah back in chapter 59 in verse 2 talks about the fact your sins and your iniquities have separated between you and God. So now you see the reach of His love. God has reached out. He has reached down as it were to those who were sinners, to those who were without strength, to those who were ungodly. That tells us the reach of His love, the extent of His love. Perhaps you've heard the old story of the old Indian chief who really well illustrated the salvation of man from sin. He drew up a little circle of flammable material, wood, leaves, stuff like that. And there was the old woolly worm right there in the middle. And he ignited the debris. And that woolly worm would scurry this way and that way and every which way trying to escape the flames. But there was no escape until the old Indian reached his hand down and let the woolly worm crawl onto his hand and he lifted him out. The missionary said that's the greatest illustration of salvation that I have ever observed. God reached down His hand for those who had no hope. They were in the most difficult position ever. Without God, without hope, and yet He reached down for them. Thirdly, think about the results of God's love. Notice, if you will, that Paul says we're justified by His blood. Verses 1 and 9 
Romans 5. Then he makes the point that we are reconciled to him. Uh, verses 5 and 11. And I don't want you to miss this point. Uh, in verse 11 where he said, And not only so, but we also joy in God through our Lord Jesus Christ by whom we have now received the atonement. There are some translations that translate that as the ASV does, the reconciliation. Instead of atonement as it is in the King James, by whom we have now received the reconciliation. To reconcile is to bring together two parties that have been separated for whatever reason. Now, we know that God hasn't moved. So it is man that has separated himself from God through his sins and iniquities. God didn't go anywhere, you'll remember, in the book of Genesis. Adam and Eve sinned against God. God was still blessing them with everything he had given them from the creation, from the time they were created. But they turned their back on him. The results of God's love, justification, reconciliation. The effect of God's love, the result is seeing the fact that we love Him because He first loved us. 1 John 4, 19. And then we love one another because God has loved us. In 1 John chapter 4, <clears throat> Let's notice a few of those verses as we bring the lesson to a close. In 1 John 4, verses 11 and 12, here's what Paul wrote, or rather John wrote. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. It just makes sense. It ought to be a natural thing. This is one of those oughts that we ought to do. One of these shoulds that we must do if we're going to be pleasing to God. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwells in us. And His love is perfected in us. That's in verse 12. Dropping down to verse 20. If a man say, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he that loves not his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And we have this commandment. Uh, from him, that he who loves God love his brother also. Then look in chapter 5. Just ignore the break. Go on and continue reading. Whosoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone that loves him that begat loves him also that is begotten of him. Notice, he who begat us is God. Those who are begotten of him are our brothers and sisters in Christ. So we ought to love. this. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Now these are the results of God's love. Is God's love producing those effects in your life, in my life? That's the result that the love of God has. Now if those results are not found in our life, then we need to ask ourselves, is the love of God in my heart? That's a very probing question, isn't it? There's a lot of hate in our world. I hope if you haven't read it, you will read the article in the bulletin. Last Sunday morning, I left the building here, and Barbara and grandmother were unable to be here, and I told them that we would, uh, or I told them that I would go and get uh, some lunch, so we went to the uh, Kentucky Colonel's place, you know, and got some chicken. And as I was going in to pick mine up to go, <clears throat> I noticed some riding right there on the sidewalk as I stepped up. I'm not into reading graffiti that much, so I thought, that doesn't look like graffiti. I thought, that might be an important message for me. <laughs> they know I park here. No, I didn't think that. But I was curious, so I stooped down to read it, and sure enough, it said, I hate you. And that's where that article for the bulletin came from. There's a lot of hate in our world. 
I wish that I had had a permanent magic marker and had written right beside that, God loves you and I do too. I think that's a message that a lot of people in our world need to hear. When you read Romans 5, you cannot help but understand how much God loves us. The giving of His Son, even when we were His enemies, God loved us. And if there is a need in this world, I believe it is an understanding and an appreciation for the love of God. Because it would change in a remarkable way the lives that are being lived in our world today. An understanding of that should be sufficient to persuade you to turn from sin, to make the good confession of your faith in Jesus as God's Son, that very gift that was given for you, and to submit to His will in being baptized into His Son's body, the church and to serve Him faithfully therein. Oh, what a price was paid for that church of which you and I are or can be members. If you've never obeyed the gospel, we hope you will do it. And you might be saying, well, I'm just such a bad person. Remember, God can heal any heart and mend any life if you will bring Him all the pieces. We hope you'll do that if you're subject. As together we stand and sing. A brother in Christ, Barry Cook, responds to the invitation this morning, stating that uh, he has said some things at work and perhaps at other places that he should not have said, and it is a, an ongoing battle with him, uh, as it is with all of us, that we do have to guard our mouths very carefully, control our tongue, and doing that is very difficult. If you doubt that, read James chapter 3, and you'll find out that it's a very difficult thing to do. That's not to underestimate the significance 
of what Barry has said or what anything like that and what all of us say from time to time. We just need to realize that that is a constant and abiding presence in our lives, that we need to keep an eye on our tongues daily. He said, I've said some things, I'm not proud of it, and I just want God to forgive me, and I want to the church to pray for me that I may have the strength to be stronger in those times uh, so that I will not succumb and yield to that temptation. Appreciate Barry's honesty in a great way, and I think all of us have an appreciation for that. We all love him, and uh, we know of his love for uh, all of us, and especially for our little children. And uh, we appreciate uh, his openness and candor in this matter. God tells us in his word that if we will confess our sins one to another and pray one for another, we can be healed, we can be forgiven. And we're thankful for that. So let's pray together at this time. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the wonderful gift of thy Son. Help us to be always in admiration of it because it defies description and goes beyond anything that we really can comprehend. But we're so thankful for the depth of that love and the giving of thy Son for our sins and for the power of his blood that we're promised will continue to forgive us or to remit our sins, wash away our sins, if we're willing to confess them and seek thy forgiveness. We come, Father, with humble hearts on behalf of our brother Barry Cook, and we ask thee to bless him in the forgiveness of anything that is not as it should be in his life. And we ask thee, Father, to give him the strength that he needs to endure temptation and to be faithful in the face of it. But Father, we pray not only for him in this regard, but for each of us. Let us all constantly pray that uh, we all might be strong in the faith and be able to stand against the wiles of the evil one. We thank thee, Father, for his courage and his desire to please thee, that thou comfort him and be with him and forgive him as thou alone can. Bless us as we continue in our service to thee this day. Watch over and protect us. This we pray in the name of Jesus, thy Son, and our Savior. Amen. We will now worship God by giving of our means. Heavenly Father, we come before you this time and humbly bow our heads in, in thanksgiving. Thank you for all the blessings that you give us each and every day. Please help us to always be mindful of these blessings and help us to not take them for granted. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us the opportunity to be able to go out into this world and earn a portion of its goods. As we give back right now, Heavenly Father, please help that we do so. Uh, with a loving heart and in a manner pleasing to you and not begrudgingly. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
paramounts for Lord's Supper will sing the first and third verses of Heavenly Father, let us at this time take our minds back to that cross at Calvary and the sacrifice that was made there for the remission of our sins. Heavenly Father, we'd ask that you would bless this bread that represents Christ's body that hung on that cross. And may we partake of it in a manner that's well-pleasing to you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Heavenly Father, as we take our minds back once again, please bless this cup of the fruit of the vine, which represents the blood that was shed by Christ on that cross. As we partake, please help that we may do so in a manner well-pleasing unto you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Our closing hymn this morning will be 401, 401. Brother Jerry Hicks will lead us in our closing prayer following the singing of that one song. We will, uh, I do not have any visitors cards today, but we know we have visitors and we're delighted you're here and we hope that you'll come every opportunity that you have to be with us. Hope you can be with us tonight at 6 o'clock for our service. Children's class will be at 545 down here at the front. And uh, Brother Ben Smith will be here tonight to give us a full report on the uh, ongoing work in India. And that is always an exciting report. And uh, the, the brethren there are facing some challenges just like we all do here. And uh, Ben will be telling us about uh, that particular work. A few notes on our sick. First of all, we're happy to have several people back with us today. Dimple Hicks, Faye Mayberry, Linda Cook, and uh, maybe others. Uh, grandmother's feeling better and able to be here today. And we're thankful for that. And we also have two very special ones here. Little Drake Washer and Josie Morris are both here today for the very first times. And we're very happy that they and their moms uh, can be here. And uh, let's remember those families in our prayer as they uh, welcome the, their new babies. And Jessica Grimm and uh, her new baby, Mary Pat, are now at home. They're not able to be with us today, but uh, keep them in your prayers too. Uh, Teddy Spivey's grandmother, Judy, uh, had surgery last Wednesday. And keep her in your prayers. We're happy to have uh, Jerry and Mary Phillips able to be back with us. And they uh, bring this thank you note. Jerry and I want to thank each and every one of you who have shown such love and care for me during my recent illness and recovery. We are very thankful in Christian love, Mary Phillips. And that is attached to this beautiful card that uh, they sent the church. We'll try to put that on the bulletin board. But uh, we're glad that both of them are able to be back with us today. Joe Hensley's surgery is scheduled for December 19. December 19 at Vanderbilt. So let's remember Joe and Ken and all the family <laughs> as uh, Joe goes through that. Gary Lester remains in Trevecca Rehab in Nashville. And uh, keep him in your prayers. And we've also been asked to remember Margaret Tooley Blair in our prayers. She has been diagnosed with cancer, a uh, very severe situation, and uh, we want to remember her. Also remember Becca Brown and uh, others who are uh, facing tests and so on. Uh, remember Scotty and Gay Yeaman and keep in your prayers also Leslie Alford and we want to have a card shower for Leslie she is now at home but is not feeling well and <clears throat> we will try to have that address available if uh, Elaine will help me to find it I, I uh, could not locate it the other day but we will try to have her and Candice can get it to us too and we will, can all send her a card as she recuperates at home. Uh, go over our sick list and remember all of those. Birthdays include Lacey and Olivia Crockett on the 11th. Mother and daughter are celebrating birthdays today. Wedding anniversaries include Jerry and Cheryl Hicks on today, the 11th. Eddie and Kaylin Lender on the 15th. And Nick and Pam Morris on the 16th. Congratulations all of these. Next Sunday will be the deadline for our Christmas cards for the sick and shut-ins. The bags and the cards are available in the foyer. Just sign your cards. Get you a packet of those cards. Sign them and put one in each one and uh, we can get those to them. Uh, Elders Deacons Preachers Meeting will be this Wednesday night uh, December 14th and copies of the agenda are available out in the foyer. The elders wanted us to be aware of the fact that we are going to be sending a contribution uh, to the uh, brethren in Gatlinburg. Uh, there are needs there that they have. Families, members there have lost uh, their homes and so on and not adequately insured. And so there's quite a bit of work to be done. And uh, our elders have decided that all 
given over the budget, the next two Sundays will be set in addition to a contribution from the church. And so if you would like to help out personally, uh, just add it to your contribution, drop it in the collection plate, and everything that's over the budget the next two weeks, given over our budget, we will uh, send that in addition to the contribution that uh, will be sent. So uh, it's an opportunity for all of us to do a good work, and uh, we can just imagine how that would be. Most of us have visited there, and uh, uh, we have probably attended services there at Gatlinburg, so let's help those brothers and sisters out. Let's uh, plan to stay for Bible study here in just a few minutes. After a brief intermission, we'll reconvene for classes. We hope you'll be with us in a class. Let's stand for the closing song in prayer, please, if you would. Almighty God and Father in heaven, we're so grateful to thee for this day and the many blessings of it. We're grateful for this opportunity that we've had to come together to study portion of thy word and to worship thee. We pray, dear Father, that everything said and done here today has been pleasing in thy sight and uplifting to us. As we're about to go to our classes, we pray, we pray that you'll go with us and watch over us, keep us through this day, help us to have the desire to return this evening, give us where we fall short. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs>